turn. I want to uh, to begin by reading you guys an email that I got yesterday. This is from a person who was basically in your shoes three years ago. He says, uh, Dr. Brad, I've been attending the Church of Christ all my life. Been a member since I was 12. I'm now 21. As you know, I went through, and I'm not going to tell you, he went through a school of preaching. I went through the so-and-so school of preaching. But I'm now really having some problems with doubt. I've talked with you a few times before, but I've never really just completely come clean and admitted the fact that I'm having a hard time with all of this. He goes on to say, I know some Christian evidences, and I know certain things, certain arguments. For whatever reason, my mind is not allowing me to accept them. And yes, I know that makes zero sense. He goes on to talk about how the waters seem very muddy to him, and that for the first time in his life, he is really struggling with even his spiritual foundation. What do I do? Is how he ended the, uh, the email. The reason I, I want to share that with you and the reason that I wanted to start with that is because, guys, you think with me for just a moment. This is a, a young man who, who went through preacher training. And yet here he is. He's in his first congregation, and he is questioning everything. That's why what we're doing is, is very important, and that's why I hope that, that one of the things that you'll remember when you move on into a congregation is the concept of evidences. <laughs> because there's going to come a point where somebody in your congregation or maybe somebody in your family wrestles with the old idea of, okay, is faith enough? What is faith? Do I have any faith? But if they know some of the evidences we're discussing, it's going to give them something to fall back on. Yes, faith is great, and we've got to have faith, and my hope is built on faith. But I also want to make sure that I have the evidence for why I believe what I believe, so that when I pick up the phone and I call this young man like I'm going to be doing here in just a little bit, I can pound into him factual things that he can rest his faith on to build him back up. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have already struggled with those kinds of things. I do know that it's real, and I just I kind of want to make sure that you, you're aware of what is going on out there. Somebody tell me the topic for today. Oh, nobody's reading their syllabus? Man, I'm going to put that on the test next time. <laughs> reading your book. Is that Today we are uh, we're discussing the dinosaurs. Yes. Why would we discuss the dinosaurs? Why is that a big deal? Because they lived 65 million years ago. Because Dean says they lived 65 million years ago. <laughs> no, because uh, that's one of the things that people use. They say dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago. If man lived, if man is, they basically say man and dinosaur couldn't live at the same time. Okay. Guys, in every congregation where you attend, what is going to probably be the very first introduction for most young children into evolution? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. In fact, I suspect Eric may have in his house right now for his young child a dinosaur book, and unless he's been extremely diligent, it's going to have something about dinosaurs roamed the earth millions of years ago. Only or, your book. Yay, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> or they may say something like, uh, dinosaurs lived long before people ever did. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, and I know some of you guys have heard this, so you kind of just bear with me, be patient. I'm going to go through uh, a typical dinosaur-like lesson. I'll, I'll pause, and you know we're going to add some stuff to it. If you have questions, if you have comments, please don't hesitate to jump in there. But understand this is uh, this is probably one of my most requested lessons just because there's not a whole lot of teachers and preachers that talk on the subject. 
but I want to make sure from the get go we all understand why it's even important to begin with. What you know, why in the world waste uh, an entire Sunday with a, a body full of Christians talking about this particular topic? Um, the fact of the matter is, when you really look at what young people are learning today, by the age of about 12, they've already been heavily indoctrinated. Let's see. Questions or comments before I get going? Is this going to be available on iDisc? Uh, if you guys would like it available on iDisc, it will certainly be there. The one thing that I would say is please do not, uh, there we go, please don't sell the PowerPoints because we don't own all the rights to every single picture that you're going to see. So, you know, if you're wanting to, like, make money on the side, this would not be how to do it. <laughs> all right. I always, whenever I talk about dinosaurs, I always make the, the point to try to bring it home that, that kids are fascinated with them. And, you know, if, if you think about it for just a moment, a lot of the toys out there, a lot of our homes are filled with all kinds of dinosaur-like figurines. They've got, you name it. And our homes have got it. But I want to stress the fact to people that it's not just kids that are fascinated with dinosaurs. If you look on the screen, those are just a, you know, a handful of the National Geographic's Time magazines that have come out fairly recently. All of these magazines are, are fairly recent. But the point being, adults are just as enthralled as young people. Now, think with me for just a moment. Roughly every six months or so, we hear about a new discovery of these amazing creatures. How much can a, a dinosaur bone actually tell you about a creature? They live in, they dead. Okay. It can definitely tell you they were once living and that they're dead. Guys, that's, realistically, that's about it. It can't tell you what color they were. It can't really well tell you what their diet composed of. Um, it can't, there, there's so many things that we basically assume, we extrapolate all the pictures that you see on these magazine covers. Understand, a lot of that is scientific interpretation where a drawer, an illustrator, basically says, you know what, I think this guy looked like this. And so he draws this thing to, to look the way he, he thinks it is. Can anybody in there give me a an example of where we maybe got it wrong? Like, for instance, anybody in there ever heard of a brontosaurus? Yeah. Do you know that there's no such thing as a brontosaurus? What happened with the brontosaurus is they kept finding the body of this creature without a head. So they find fossilized ribs, they find legs, they find arms. And so they literally just grew a head on this guy. Well, years later, after the word brontosaurus had become kind of a a synonymous with this big, large neck creature, they finally found a intact uh, creature that had the, the body and the head. And they realized they'd already named that head as an apatosaurus. A-P-A-T-A-U-R-S-U-S. -S. So, you know, basically what you find now, if you go online and you Google brontosaurus, you're going to find out they're trying hard to eradicate that name out of the books because the creature doesn't exist. It was a figment of their imagination. Another example of that. How many of you guys saw or read articles or you know textbooks that talked about the T-Rex being this fierce, meat-eating creature that, that would basically gobble up anything that came in its way? You know what they think today? They think the T-Rex was like a buzzard. And basically, 
would wait until something else had killed an animal, and then he would come in and clean it up. And the reason that they think this, and guys, this makes perfect sense. Think about it for just a moment. Have you ever seen the front arms of a T-Rex? <laughs> It's not like they can go grab something and shake him. And it, This guy, they now know, according to the kinesiology studies, he was extremely slow. We used to think he was this fast meat eater, you know, run around, rip your head off. Well, now we know he's a slow guy. His front arms are no good to him. So basically what they believe today, rather than what they used to teach, is this guy's a buzzard. He would literally just swoop in, you know, after somebody has killed something, stand there, look a little menacing, and get to clean up lunch. But the point is, those fossils can only tell you so much. I'll give you a third example of, of where the, uh, the fossil and the dinosaur myth was wrong. Many, many textbooks, they feature these long-necked, dinosaurs with their heads up in the trees eating the leaves out of the trees. Well, they've now discovered, again, through further studies, that more than likely those creatures were grazers, meaning they ate vegetation on the ground and that they kept their head very low because they say, they said after, after studying this thing, the amount of blood pressure that it would take in order to pump blood up to their heads in a raised position would literally rupture their vessels. And so, you know, you've got anatomy that's working against the picture that they've been trying to sell generations of kids over and over and over again. Largest dinosaur we have ever discovered is called the Argentinosaurus. They estimate this guy to be 110 tons. His largest rib bone is 14 feet long. Now, in order to make sure you guys, I know today we don't, we don't use metrics much. Somebody tell me how much does a, a horse weigh? Horse. Or an elephant. What's an elephant weigh? You, the uh, horses are somewhere in the ton range. The largest imperial elephant we've ever discovered, guys, weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to, to nine tons. This guy is 110. Now, just to give you an idea of how big he was, that's me standing underneath him. And you'll notice he stretches literally from one end of the, the museum to the next. Now, one of the things I would point out, let's see, can you guys see the arrow on the screen? Yeah. To the, really. on the right. The guy that's behind him, that's a full-size T-Rex. Wow. Huh. So you can see that that guy is pretty small compared to this guy. In fact, I took a picture of just his foot. But here again, the point is, you know, when you look at something like this, you know kids are absolutely amazed. They're enthralled. They want to know about it. They filled up their homes with all kinds of, of dinosaur games and paraphernalia. Grandparents are great at buying all kinds of dinosaur stuff. And it doesn't just stop there. You think about what the world is trying to do with these creatures. On the screen, you see a uh, Wendy's kids meal bag a kids meal bag that's actually teaching evolution so even though you think you know I'm gonna feed my kids these chicken nuggets they're harmless what exactly are they trying to sell your kids on I would point out at the bottom in that red box that I just highlighted notice very carefully the wording they use right here guys in big bold red letters they use the word fact then underneath it says, new findings show the birds are probably related to dinosaurs. Scientists in China have discovered two fossils of feathered dinosaurs. Now think about that again. Fact. New findings show the birds are probably related to dinosaurs. 
But that's a fact. They're probably related. <laughs> All right, so your, your child grows up a little bit. Let's say they're now 10, 11, 12 years old, and they start taking field trips. And maybe they go somewhere like the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. Or maybe they go somewhere like the Furman Bank Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. Or they maybe travel over to Chicago's Field Museum to see Sue, that massive T-Rex. Now, ask yourself, guys, how many of the parents of the children on the screen do you think actually thought about what the kids would be reading that day? Because I, I took the picture that they're looking at. That's, I took that picture. And I took the picture of the placard that they're reading right there that they're gathered around. And, guys, there's no way to harmonize what they're reading with the Bible. You just physically cannot do it. And so here you've got kids that are looking at bones that are real. I would point out that most of those bones are cast. It's not the real McCoy. But still, they're looking at something that they can visually see, they can touch. To them, that's real. And then they're reading something about it that doesn't fit the Bible. So which one do you think they're eventually going to put their their allegiance in. The Bible that, you know, they, they struggle with and maybe they can't see versus this that they can see. Well, what they can see. Jerry, how, Jerry, how old are your daughters? Uh, my daughter's 14. Your daughter ever seen something like that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Magic School Bus. Very popular kids series. Guys, you open it up and look at what it says. The little boy's got a picture of a dinosaur chasing a caveman. He says, this story is make-believe. And his friend says, yeah, there were no dinosaurs in the time of cave people. Top left-hand corner says, no people ever saw a dinosaur. When early humans appeared on the earth, dinosaurs had already been dead for millions of years. People found out about dinosaurs from fossils. Or maybe your kids like um, the Magic Treehouse. Another very popular kid series. In fact, guys, I would point out this is, if you look very, very carefully in the word Magic Treehouse at the top, you'll notice it says Research Guide Number One. This is the first of the guidebooks. Why do you think they would use dinosaurs? What better way to hook a kid, guys? You know, this is, this is, if you want to hook children, Dinosaurs are the way to do it. You opened up that particular book, and inside it says, Human beings, of course, had not yet evolved. Now, understand, this is targeting children ages 10 to 12. You turn the page into the middle of the book, and they got a timeline. And hopefully, I don't have to tell you that that timeline doesn't fit the Bible. You've got the Jurassic period, allegedly 251 to 303, 203 million years ago. And then supposedly the first humans came along 200,000 years ago. So here's the dilemma. Here's the problem. Our young people today are learning a timeline that dinosaurs died out roughly 65 million years ago. We came along allegedly carrying our clubs roughly three million years ago. And yet everybody in there knows the Bible teaches a very different picture, and that is the Bible says man and dinosaur were created literally on the same day. They're both land-dwelling creatures. So we would have to coexist. We're going to look at some evidence for that today, but the point I want to make is this. If your kids leave your home and they basically have bought into this idea that we're separated by millions of years, you can just bank on the concept that eventually their faith is going to be very, very faulty and weak. Because if they can't harmonize in their mind Genesis 1, then they're going to question the rest of the Bible as well. Philip Kitcher wrote a book called Abusing Science, the Case Against Creationism. 
in which he claimed that solid evidence for the coexistence of dinosaurs and humans, notice what he says here, would shake the foundations of the evolutionary theory, because, of course, the dinosaurs are supposed to have been long extinct by the time hominids arrived on the scene. I want you guys to remember what he's saying. Solid evidence of humans coexisting with dinosaurs would shake the foundations of the evolutionary theory. Because we're going to spend a long time today just looking at nothing but that evidence and talking about how we can know God created man and dinosaurs on day six. National Geographic Geo Guide page, the very first sentence says, No human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. Why is that a problem? Bible says that Job has seen them. Absolutely. Yeah. What else? Creation says they're on the same day. Okay. Somebody, somebody tell me this. What did we used to say in the church 20, 30 years ago? I don't know. I don't know either. Jerry, what do we Everybody's pointing to the old man. <laughs> what did we used to teach children about dinosaurs, say, 25, 30 years ago? If they didn't exist. They and... Right. If they didn't exist. What? Why is that a problem today? Why can't we say that anymore? Because we know they exist. Physical evidence. Yeah, yeah, evidence. What do you mean by physical evidence? Well... You know, just the pictures you were showing us of the dinosaurs in the museum. I mean, yeah, they, they exist. Okay. They didn't exist. All right, so let me, let me play the devil's advocate for a moment. Let's say that Paul comes up to me, and he is trying to teach me this. And I look Paul in the eyes, and I say, Paul, 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 bless your heart. You just don't know that this is what God buried in the, the dirt when he made everything. And we're just now digging it up and finding it. What's the problem with that? Makes God a God of confusion. Good point. Very good point. What else? God is not a God of confusion. And how long a time span did he make everything? Six days. Six days. Six days. Yeah. Guys, if he made everything in six days, does that leave a whole lot of time for him to be burying these creatures? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What is a better explanation for us finding dinosaur fossils? Blood. Blood. Okay. Why don't we find a lot of human fossils? Tucked away in her little caskets. <laughs> <laughs> or? <laughs> Could they be disintegrated because the bone structure was so much smaller? Okay, there you go. Guys, think about what it takes to fossilize something. you got to have a lot of pressure. Sometimes seed isn't involved. you got to have diatoms to replace. you got this massive animal that's covered over. It has a whole lot better shot at being fossilized than a smaller human or than a smaller mouse. So does it make sense that, like on the Colorado-Utah border, you've got a, a rock wall where there's hundreds of dinosaur bones embedded in it? Yeah, because those are bigger creatures. They're going to be able to withstand some of the fossilization process a lot better than a human. I mean, the biggest bone in your body right now is your femur. The femur of a human being is a whole lot smaller than some of, the, some of the even small bones of this creature. Remember I just told you the rib bone on a uh, Argentinosaurus, the rib bone itself is 14 feet. So you're talking about major differences. All right, a little bit of history. Dean, tell the class when the first dinosaur fossil was discovered. 
got no idea, Brad. Come on, man. Actually, that's a trick question. Man and dinosaurs coexisted, so, you know, we, we go all the way back. But, as far as recent times is concerned, Eric, what you got? Uh, 1825. 1825. And what he's talking about is actually uh, in a place in, uh, it's actually in a museum in New Zealand. There is a tooth that was discovered by a fellow by the name of Gideon Mantell. They, uh, they let me sneak down and look at it there in the, uh, the basement of the museum. I'm going to go ahead and give you guys the full story just because we have some time and because you may use it in your, uh, your lessons in the future. Long story short, this doctor was called to a patient's house. Dr. Gideon Mantell goes out. He decides to take his wife with him. Her name is Mary Ann. They arrive at the, the patient's house. Mary Ann decides she's going to stay outside, take a stroll. It's a beautiful day. While she's out there walking around, she comes across a pile of stones. Now, these stones were there for a reason. They had been specifically cut out of a quarry and were used to fill in the ruts of the road caused by the spring rains. But she looks down at this pile of rocks, and she notices one of them is not a rock, but rather it's a tooth. Only it's much, much too large to be a tooth. So she picks it up. She takes it back to her husband. He was amazed. Had never seen anything like it. They eventually went back to the quarry from where those particular, uh, where the, the rocks were cut. And they found more teeth, more bones. And in 1825, that is when Dr. Mantell named this creature Iguanodon. Now, from 1825 to 1845, more and more and more of these kinds of fossils and bones and teeth started showing up. In fact, there were two guys. Uh, one of them's last name was Marsh. They basically started what we call today the Dinosaur Wars. They were in a race to see who could find the most and name the most. Between 1825 and 1845, more of these things started showing up to where finally, in the year 1845, a fellow by the name of Sir Richard Owen coined the term dinosaur. He used two Greek words, dinos, soros, translated by him as fearfully great lizard. And that's, that's realistically, that is when our fascination, as far as recent times is concerned, that is when our fascination with these creatures began. The point that you need to stress to folks is, is this. It's not a question of did the dinosaurs walk the earth, because we know they did. The real question is when did they walk the earth? All right, let's look at some stuff together. Actually, I'll tell you what, before I do that, I, I tell this joke, so I'll show you guys. I don't, I don't hardly ever get to show all my pictures to folks, so uh, y'all will have to bear with me for a second. See if I can find it. And I'm gonna unplug you here so I can actually see you guys. Questions or comments so far? Oh, uh, see, now y'all are going to clam up on me. Okay, give me just a second. Let's see. Hey, Brad, I have a question. Sure. Okay, you're talking about back in 1825 through 45 there. Scientists were having a dinosaur battle, so to speak, you're saying? Yeah. What were they dating the dinosaurs? How old back then? They weren't really dating the dinosaurs. Um, when, did, uh, when did Charlie's book come out? Oh. What year? Man, I should have put that on the test. 1859. Okay. Now, think about this. 
That's uh, I'm having I may we may have to come back to this. That's when the book came out. If his book didn't come out till 1859, that means basically the whole idea of evolution, natural selection, was not even really in vogue. So while you had some people that were thinking older Earth, the vast majority of people were not. The vast majority of people were basically still thinking. Um, and here's, John, here's how I know that. If you were to look up the word prehistoric prior to 1860, when Noah Webster did his first dictionary, the word prehistoric wasn't even in there. So, you know, it's one of those things where back during that time, people didn't believe that things were that old. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look one more place real quick. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? All right. Let me see if this is them. I got some pictures in here uh, where we did a uh, a dinosaur dig, and we excavated out of a uh, well. Let's let's go ahead and look at these. This will be this isn't them, but I'll find them. I'll find them during the break. <clears throat> All right. Okay, this is in uh, this is in Texas. What we're about to see. Um, I always take pictures of signs just because they're trying to teach evolutionary garbage. One day, about 105 million years ago, a small herd of four-footed plant-eating dinosaurs fled southward along an ancient shoreline. Their mortal enemy, a two-footed meat-eating dinosaur, pursued close on their heels. Evidence of their passage was buried, turned into stone. This is uh, in a place called Glen Rose, Texas. So here's the sign. This is the creek that is right in front of it. And this is what you see in the creek. Hopefully you guys can see that's a very detailed three-toed dinosaur print. Uh, here's a better one. You can actually see where his, his toes kind of went down. And another one. And let's see, there's a path. So you can kind of see that, you know, yeah, we do have some good evidence for these creatures. These, you can actually see the, the white stuff where they made plaster Paris cast of these creatures that is around them. Um, let's keep going. We'll come back to these. All right. What kind of evidence do we have for the coexistence of, of humans and dinosaurs? We'll start right here. They, in the year 2005, scientists found a dinosaur in the belly of a mammal. Why is that a big deal? Dinosaurs are supposed to be before mammals. Dinosaurs are not just supposed to be before mammals. They're supposed to be before mammals by like... 30, 40, 50 million years. And yet you got a dinosaur that was eaten by a mammal. Probably one of my favorites is this one. It's uh, the Icostones of Peru. A gentleman by the name of Dr. Javier Cabrera was given one of these stones as a birthday gift. He looked at it. He noticed it had these elegant carvings on it. He went back to the gentleman who had given him this. It was a local farmer there in Peru. He asked him, he said, hey, where did this come from? The, the man told him, he said, hey, these are burial stones that the ancient Incan Indians used to place in their tombs. 
So, for instance, if you look very carefully here, you'll notice you've got a dead person in a tomb with one of these Ica stones beside it. Dr. Cabrera decided to set out and find as many of these things as he could. All told, he found about 11,000 of them. Now, just as a, a quick aside, there's actually record of these burial stones that goes all the way back to like the 15, 1600s, where men who were exploring, they would actually come to this area, they would put them on boats and take them to the Orient. So it's not like these particular stones are, you know, hidden and, and that they suddenly risen and it's a, a big quick internet hoax. These things have actually been around for a long time. Found about 11,000 of them, a third of them showing dinosaurs on it, and not just dinosaurs. If you look at this one, for instance, it's got a, a man who has domesticated a dinosaur. Or if you look at the bottom panel of this one, the bottom right, you'll notice that guy has got a spear to the dinosaur's neck. Like, basically, hey, look, I'm, I'm killing this thing. Now, again, guys, you know, I'm, I've been doing this long enough to know there are a lot of people out there who would say, hey, this is a hoax, it's, it's not real. We know there's several reasons why we know these are real. Number one, the ancient Incan Indians got things right that we just recently have un uncovered. I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you two quick examples. The first example has to do with seropod dinosaurs. If you look carefully on this slide, you'll notice outlined in yellow, there are these durable frills that the ancient Incan Indians used to, to carve on these seropod dinosaurs. Well, for the longest time, researchers said that didn't happen. They'd never seen that in the fossil record. Well, in 1992, they made a discovery of some fossilized skin of a seropod dinosaur. And look what the title of their article is, A New Look for Seropod Dinosaurs, in which they go on to say, Recent discovery of fossilized seropod skin impressions reveals a significantly different appearance for these dinosaurs. The fossilized skin demonstrates that a median row of spines was present. Some are quite narrow. Others are broader and more conical. In fact, talking about this, Ellen Morse Bishop, she wrote, The biggest spines found were about nine inches long, shaped a little bit like a shark's dorsal fin. The smallest at the tail tip were about three inches high. The other thing that I would point out is, these Incan Indians carved bumpy rosette patterns onto the dinosaur skin. And again, researchers said, that's not right. We've never seen that. That was until we found some fossilized dinosaur skin that had these bumpy rosette patterns on it. That was in 1998 that they made that discovery. But my point is the same. That is, these things could not have been, how, how in the world would they have known about these dermal frills or these rosette patterns long before we ever discovered the truth? One thing that I'll point out, too, that you're not going to hear on CNN or Time, they actually were going to do a documentary trying to disprove these stones. And they went down to an area around Peru where they knew that there were some tombs in the ground. And they've got their film crews rolling. They're there to disprove this thing. They decided that they were going to break through the foundation of one of the oldest home structures there. Because they figured, you know, if you've got a house foundation, then nobody could have planted anything underneath it. So whatever we find is going to be actually accurate. So they buy the house. They pay for it. They dig through it. Camera's rolling. And lo and behold, they find Ica stones, one of which had a dinosaur-like creature on it. Guess what never, ever, ever was shown on TV? The camera footage where they had gone down there basically was destroyed for all intent and purposes. 
The only reason I know about it was one of the guys who was actually with them was a creationist, and he, he basically was like, Brad, when this happened, it was a bombshell for him because all along they have been doing this, spent a lot of money just to disprove these stones, and yet the reality of it was they proved them. Another piece of evidence would be the dinosaur figurine from Acambaro, Mexico. This time, a, a gentleman, he was riding on the back of a horse, and from that elevated position, he found the first of these dinosaur figurines. He was around what's called the, the El Toro Mountain. There, that basically translated the bull down around Mexico. They decided, after so many of these things started showing up, that they would have them dated. So if you imagine for just a moment, scientist comes in, he takes just a little piece of a tail, or maybe a, a little piece of a foot. He takes that sample, because it's been fired, it's ceramic. He takes it, he sends it off to a laboratory. Actually, they send it to two laboratories, the University of Pennsylvania, and Teledyne Labs in New Jersey. Didn't tell them where it came from, just said, hey, will you date this? They did, it came back with dates of roughly 2,000 years B.C. They then sent 18 additional samples to be what's called thermal luminescent tested because they really wanted to make sure they had this thing right. Well, lo and behold, it came back with dates of roughly 2,000 B.C. So, Picture in your mind, you've got these labs that are calling up saying, hey, the stuff you gave us looks like it's probably about 2000 B.C. Right before they certified their findings, they made the mistake of telling the labs, hey, you know that stuff you're looking at, it's coming from dinosaur figurines. At which point, both labs did the same thing. They withdrew their results and said, we're unable to give you any accurate readings on your material." Now, guys, that is just totally bogus. 1990, we sent off some dinosaur bones at the University of Arizona. Didn't tell them it was dinosaur bone, just simply said, hey, we want you to date this. It's a blind study. They did. came back. If you look very carefully, right about, let me move my arrow down, right here. You see the date of 9,890 years, plus or minus 60. Guys, granted, that's not precisely 6,000 years, but that is a far cry from 65 million years. One of the coolest discoveries two of your faculty members have seen. Over in Cambodia, there is a Buddhist temple. One of the things that I want you to notice very carefully here. Guys, this one you cannot fake. And the reason I say you can't fake it, if you look carefully, what's going on right here? You can got tree roots that are growing into this temple. I mean, this thing had literally been grown up through the jungle, had been forgotten about. They come in, they find this temple. They have to, to kill all of the vegetation, pull back the vines, the the roots, and when they do so, they discover these intricate carvings. So, for instance, I'm going to point the top right here. This guy right here, that's a monkey. You see his head up here, his front feet, his tail's actually going up behind his head. Down here, you've got a deer. You see his antlers, his tail in the up position back here. His back legs, his front legs, his face. But they didn't just stop with, with monkeys and deers, guys. They also did things like dinosaurs. Now, again, the question is, how did they know what to draw if they'd never seen this? Now, I'm going to kick out for just a second. I'll show you guys some more pictures that Michael Hyde showed me. You guys may have already seen these. If so, consider this review. If not, consider yourself treated.
There we go. All right, so here's the temple. There you can see a face carved in. You can see the likings, the, uh, all the different stuff that has been grown up into this rock. There you can see some pretty elegant carvings. Again, trees growing up all around this thing. Massive temple. And that gives you kind of a perspective of how big this thing is. You may not be able to see it well, but there are elephants in the, uh, the rock right here. More carvings. More carvings. One of the ironic points is uh, all of the other animals that you see carved into these particular buildings, every single one of them is real. And yet, allegedly, the, uh, the dinosaur is not real. I asked Michael Height, I said, you know, what do they say? He told me, he said, you know, the last time he was up there that basically they explained it as a porcupine. Yeah, that's what Neil said. Yeah. Guys, I don't know about you, that doesn't look like a porcupine to me. <laughs> In fact, what kind of dinosaur is that? Stegosaurus. It's a stegosaurus. There you see uh, uh, the Japanese guy trying to tell everybody that it's a porcupine. But there again, I, you know, the point being, if you look carefully, guys, this is the kind of stuff you just really cannot fake. You got tree roots growing through this stuff, and that's that's impossible for somebody to come in there and, and you know, and yet, yeah. What do you, um, let me word this right. How do we know they're just not really creative people, as some would say? Great question. Go back and look at these things. Doo -doo -doo. All of the other creatures. Let me find. Well, let me go. Let me go forward. All of the other creatures are known creatures, like elephants or. Hold on. Let me pull back out to right here. You look, you got, you got a monkey, you got a deer, you got elephants, you got a rhinoceros, you got a water buffalo. Even one of the pictures has got a human. And the point being would be, okay, you got all of these other ones right. Are we to then just say that they've got a good imagination and that it, their imagination was so good that they carved a stegosaurus? To the point where a 10 year old child can tell you what that is? <coughs> you see the, the, the point? Yeah. If, if all this other stuff is real, then first off, why did they do some stuff that was fake? Second off, it's ironic that that particular thing is so well done that an 8 year old living in 2010 can tell me what it is. This was, uh, this was found by a buddy of mine by the name of Dr. Dennis Swift. He's been doing digs down in the uh, Latin American region. This was a child's poncho that the child was buried with. And you'll notice, obviously, it's got dinosaur-like creatures on it. You guys are, are close enough that you could actually go to see the next one. Uh, if you go over to the Natural Bridges National Monument just west of Blanding, Utah. There are three natural sandstone bridges, one of which is called Kachina. And it's on that particular sandstone bridge that you're going to find all kinds of petroglyphs by the Anzazi Indians. And they've carved things like, for instance, bighorn sheep, and they've also carved things like dinosaurs. 
I want you to notice the quote underneath this picture. This is by Fran Barnes, who is an evolutionist. He's also an authority on rock art in the American Southwest. He said, there's a petroglyph in National Bridges National Monument that bears a striking resemblance to a dinosaur. Why didn't he just call it a dinosaur? Because he's an evolutionist. Yeah, guys, remember what, Philip, remember what Philip Kitcher said. Solid evidence of humans coexisting with dinosaurs would shake the foundations of the evolutionary theory. Now, one of the points that I want to make on this same bridge, you got petroglyphs of big horn sheep, you got dinosaurs, you've also got, for instance, men that are carved in there. But you also have flying reptiles. You know, ter pterodactyls, pteranodons, etc. The next two slides I show you, I do expect you to at least remember something about them. Because to me, they pack one of the most powerful perches. Because they're from historians, and they're talking about these flying reptiles. The first is from Herodotus, a Greek historian, 5th century B.C. Look at what he says. There's a place in Arabia to which I went on hearing of some winged serpents, and when I arrived there, I saw bones and spines of serpents in such quantities as it would be impossible to describe. The form of the serpent is like that of a water snake, but he has wings without feathers and like it is possible to the wings of a bat. Guys, Herodotus described flying reptiles and knew that they weren't birds or bats. The next one is from a Jewish historian. Some of you probably recognize the name, Josephus. Josephus, who lived at the time of some of our apostles, who chronicled the death of Jesus Christ at the hands of Pilate, and who also discussed flying reptiles. He said, when the ground was difficult to be passed over because of the multitude of serpents, which it produces in vast numbers, some of which ascend out of the ground unseen, and they also fly in the air, they do come upon men and unawares and do them a mischief. He said, Moses made baskets likened to arcs of sage and filled them with eaves or birds and carried them along with them, which animal is the greatest enemy to the serpents imaginable. For they fly from them when they come near them, and as they fly, they're caught, and they're devoured by them. Guys, he wrote this in his book, Antiquities of the Jews, almost 2,000 years ago. What does that do to the evolutionary theory? Keeping in mind, both of these historians lived long before Charles Darwin ever even was a thought. Makes it really does when you think about it. Hey, Brad. This is a yeah. Um, wouldn't uh, most not most scholars, but some scholars throw out Josephus because of some of his controversial uh, writings, like the passage we looked at regarding uh, Christ. Some, some scholars would throw out that particular passage, absolutely. But would the same scholars throw out the rest of his texts and the rest of his history? Absolutely not. I don't know of any true scholar, when you say scholar, that would throw out Josephus as being a historian and chronicling a lot of the things that happened to the Jewish community. Well, Is there a question about whether or not he, he talked about Jesus being the Christ and, and doing marvelous deeds? Yeah, there are some people who question whether or not that was truly Josephus' words. Mm -hmm. But to say that because of those two paragraphs that they throw out the entire works of Josephus is crazy. This is a uh, textile dated roughly 400 to 700 AD. Another thing that's kind of interesting. Over in England, there is a uh, place called the Carlisle Cathedral. And if you ever get over there, you have to roll up the carpet you see at the bottom of the screen, because below that particular carpet there is the tomb of a guy who died in 1496. 
again, just as a quick refresher, when did I say the word dinosaur came into existence? 1845. 1825 was when uh, Mantell named that creature Iguanodon. 1845, Sir Richard Owen says, hey, there are a lot of these things out there. We're going to call them dinosaurs. And yet, in 1496, you got a bishop who's buried in this cathedral. You roll up the carpet, you see that beautiful marble, elegant tomb where they've carved things like eels, foxes, cats, dogs, and even dinosaurs. Again, I would point out, guys, this is 350 years before the word dinosaur even comes into existence. Or maybe one of you guys can explain to me this Mayan vase. It's on display. Uh, at, uh, the museum just slipped my head. But it's dated at roughly 100 A.D. And obviously that is a dinosaur-like creature that has been carved into it. The question is, how did the Mayans know it? You know, Dean, it's one of those things where if I came and did a seminar and I showed one or two of these, I could understand somebody sitting in the audience saying, you know what, that's imagination. But when you start hammering with like 20 or 30, you've gone way beyond imagination. And at this point, you're now having to explain on six different continents, different types of dinosaurs, and how people could have known what they look like. Dr. Samuel Hubbard was the curator for the uh, Oakland, California Museum of Natural History. And basically, he had a gut hunch that the American Indians had been on this continent for much longer than we were giving them credit for. He set out into an, uh, an expedition with literally several hundred people. They set out down into the Grand Canyon off one of the side canyons called the Havai Supai Canyon where they were looking for evidence of the Native Americans. Looking for things like broken pieces of pottery or, or clothing or anything that would prove that yes, they were here. And lo and behold, his hunch was right. He found their pottery, he found their clothing, but he also stumbled across their cave art. I want you to read with me what he had to say when he discovered that one of these pieces of cave art was a dinosaur. Notice at the bottom I list his credentials and I list the fact that dinosaur tracks were preserved nearby. Now they would date them at 165 million years old, but the point being you got dinosaur tracks nearby. He says taking all in all the proportions are good. The huge reptile is depicted in the attitude in which man was most likely to see it. Reared on its hind legs, balancing with a long tail, either feeding or in a fighting position, possibly defending itself against a party of men. He goes on to say the fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories regarding the antiquity of man. The fact that the animal is upright and balanced on its tail would seem to indicate that the prehistoric artist must have seen it alive. Hey, Brad? Yes? Is this guy an evolutionist or a creationist? <laughs> Dude, he's the curator of a museum. What do you think? <laughs> just wondering. Just making sure. <laughs> you mean there are no creationists that are curators of museums? Uh, if y'all will remind me, I'll show you something about that here in just a minute. The, uh, there's a picture of what he saw. And just to make sure that you guys understand, that's a picture of it up close. And there is the creature that they were modeling it after, known as the Edmontosaurus. Now, if you look very carefully, right where the arrow is kind of jumping around, You'll notice that white hole? That's actually a bullet hole where some 
sweet evolutionist was trying to destroy this by shooting it up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is my favorite. Yeah, this one's pretty good. You got soft tissue in a T-Rex bone. Uh, again, I talked to the lady who made this discovery. Her name is Mary Schweitzer. And she shared with me, guys, the fact that the reason they even found this soft tissue was because they had this, this long bone, the femur of the T-Rex. They, had, they were going to basically try to get it back to the lab in one piece, so they had encased it in what you and I would call plaster paris. They got this huge block of material. They rent a helicopter to take it back to the lab. Helicopter gets there where well, they find out that that block of material was physically too big to fit inside the helicopter. So they decided literally on the spot to break it right down the middle, to cut it in two. And she said when they did so, they were able to, to look inside this T-Rex bone where they found soft tissue, blood vessels, and what she believes are blood cells. Now, guys, anytime you got soft tissue, blood vessels, or blood cells, that should tell you that creature hadn't been dead for millions and millions of years. Now, the obvious question that comes to me, Dean, would be, all right, why haven't we found this in other dinosaur bones? So you know what they it. told me? They didn't try to look. Was, yeah, they haven't been looking. They've made the assumption that these bones are 65 million years old. They haven't been cracking them open to see if they've got soft tissue inside. Hey, Brad? Yeah. I read something on... Uh, Institution creation research, and they said that they found uh, more of these uh, in 2009. Soft tissue? They found more. Uh, uh, I got it here. It says uh, Cretaceous dinosaur fossils with uh, original, uh, like, soft tissue and stuff like that in it. So they're coming up more and more. Who did the work? Um... The source that he has is um, Schweitzer. MH. Uh, yeah, that's me. Mary Schweitzer did the original. I'm just wondering who did the uh, follow up at ICR because I, I know most of those guys. Oh, um, the author is Brian Thomas. Okay. Guys, this, if you really think about it, this is kind of a, uh, a bomb for the evolutionist. Because you should not have soft tissue anywhere close to something that's 65 million years old. And yet, we've got the fossil. It won't ever be put in textbooks, but we've got it. You got stuff like pottery from South America that was found in tombs. Again, showing very classic designs of what we would call dinosaur-like creatures. These are burial clothes. 700 AD, if you blow one of these patches up, so basically what I'm showing you is this right here. If we enlarge that, you've got a, a dinosaur-like creature that was embroidered. Um, Tomb of the deserts of Peru often preserve amazing artifacts which are very old, including beautiful intricate textiles from the Nazca culture. These textiles depict living dinosaurs as do the ceremonial barrel stones, pottery indicating that these awesome creatures are still alive at the point of the ancient Peruvians saw them. So, you know, one of the things that you need to keep asking yourself as you look at all this stuff is how did these people know what to, to paint or draw or carve if they'd never seen it? This is one that if you guys ever get over there, I hope you'll take a picture of it for me because I, I really would like a better shot. This is a Roman mural from 2nd century A.D. showing two long-necked dragons. But if you look very carefully, I don't know how well your screen shows it. These are hand-laid tiles. Now, 
Somebody tell me when was our Bible basically completed in the form that we have it today? Oh, come on now. Are you talking like when it was final, like 90 AD? Is that what you're talking about? Like 90, 90, 90, yeah, 90 to 93 AD, right? Yeah. Guys, the point being, this mural was laid down just after that happened. So to put it in perspective, you've probably got children of some of the, you know, the, the apostles that married you got children of those men still walking the earth. You got people who were in the first century church still walking the earth. This is a Mesopotamian cylinder seal that looks an awful lot like what you and I would call Empatosaurus. Again, how do they know what to draw if they'd never seen this creature? These are tablets that are attributed to Narmer, the, the legendary first pharaoh of United Egypt. And again, if you look carefully, you see these long-necked dinosaur-like creatures. So do we have good evidence? Absolutely. Do you think your kids are going to see it? Probably not. I mean, your kids may see it, but the reality of it is not too many people will. Let me show you the, a couple more of these. These are uh, these are some things that I was able to take pictures of. Somebody tell me what this is right here. Is that a pot or is that like a jar? Yeah, jar. It is a it's a like a vase or a pot. That's a quarter, just to give you a size reference. But I want you to notice what they carved the handle into. Oh, they made it some it, sort of... It's a dinosaur. Here's his tail. There's his mouth. And the point being that this particular pot guy was found with some Native American tribes that go all the way back to roughly 200 A.D. There's another shot of it just to give you a better perspective. There you can see his legs. His face. Um, I'll show you these just for fun. That's a human handprint in limestone that allegedly, according to evolutionists, was laid down 300 million years ago. What's the problem? What's the problem with that? Even by evolutionary standards, man doesn't come along till 3.5 million years ago. How many other five-digited creatures do you know of that could put their hand in that same slot where I'm, my hand is resting? I don't know there are no other animals that have hands like that, guys. And yet they would say this stone was laid down 300 million years ago. Brad, what about primates? They have, think about opposable thumbs. You know of any primate that can fit that? I would welcome it if you did. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is you can't. Here's, here's the cool part, Dean. On this one, they actually have a little bit, and I do mean a li just a small bit, in these two uh, areas where you can actually see the nail bed that was captured by this mud before it became rock. And, you know, it's everything about it is screaming human. But there again, let me ask you this, Dean. How many apes should have been around 300 million years ago? Uh, zero. Yeah. <laughs> that was me holding a very precious thing that I didn't want to drop. Uh, let's see. All right. Questions or comments before we keep going? <clears throat> would you would you guys say, from what I've showed you thus far, and we'll look at some more, but 
Would you say that there is evidence out there that that would prove man and dinosaurs coexist? Yes. What do you think would happen if you got to go into every high school and show this kind of man? Basically, if you just spend an hour, don't bring up the Bible at all. If you just take an hour and you show nothing but this kind of material, what's going to happen? You're going to get sued. <laughs> you probably would get sued, but no, because what's no going to happen to the kids? Hopefully they'll have doubt in what they've been taught since uh, they first started uh, public education. Mine will be open to eyes. I think, guys, the reality of it is, you know, I'm talking to a lot of kids after I do this. They realize that evolution cannot be true, that it's a fairy tale. And if you've got this much stuff that is showing their timeline to be totally corrupt and totally messed up, they realize that's garbage and that that's fairy tale, once upon a time kind of stuff. And so if you give them a, a strong dose of this, all of a sudden they will start questioning everything from that point forward. So, you know, to me, this is kind of the shot in the arm that a lot of young people are looking for. It, it Basically, you can walk into a school and never mention God or the Bible, show this stuff, and a kid leaves understanding, you know what, that stuff that I learned in Bible class, maybe that's not so far-fetched after all. And it is it is strong in their hands. Um I don't think I don't know that I'll ever see it in textbooks in my lifetime. I would love to see some of this stuff in there because I think it really, you know, to me, this is the kind of evidence and proof that kids need to be exposed to. Then just to give you an idea of how strong it is, if when I go on university campuses, I'll, I'll soup up my lessons. There are a lot more scientific evidence backed up stuff and less Bible. Real quick, I had a guy who came and, and told me, came up afterwards, he said, you know, he said, for the first four or five slides of your dinosaur lesson, I was ready just to hammer you during the Q&A. But he said, after you hit about 20 or 30, he said, I realized I didn't have a leg to stand on. Because it's that overwhelming. You know, the first three or four, you're thinking, well, maybe it's their imagination. Maybe it could be an artifact. Maybe it's just, but after you get so many, it's like, okay, there's got to be something there. Yep.